Welcome back, folks, to Wrestle Rants. I'm Graham G.S. and Matthews. And moving forward for the next couple of editions of Wrestle Rant, we will be breaking down solely post WrestleMania editions of Monday Night Raw, some of my favorite shows of the year, as I'm sure they are for you as well. And uh, WrestleMania 32 right around the corner. And since we broke down every single WrestleMania and WrestleMania history last year, I figured we would focus this year on the post WrestleMania episodes of Raw. And we'll also be reviewing WrestleMania 31 on. Tuesday. I might put it up on Wednesday because uh, I know the uh, or, you know I know we usually put the videos up on Saturdays and sometimes Sundays and uh, Tuesdays or rather Wednesdays now with the way the schedule works with my channel. But I might put it up on Tuesday just because that is the exact one year anniversary this coming Tuesday. But in the meantime and in between time, we are talking about the post WrestleMania 28 episode of Monday Night Raw from 2012. One of my favorite Raws of all time. I fucking love this show and this really kicked off in my opinion. What has become the best show of the year for WWE, the post-WrestleMania Raw, where new storylines kick off, new fresh faces debut, storylines wrap up, new champions crowned, shocks galore, shockers galore on this episode of Raw every single year. This year should be no exception. Uh, but I will mention this, though. Like I said, one of my favorite episodes of Raw of all time. We're breaking it down here today. And I rarely do episodes of Raws here on WrestleRant just because I can do them in the retro review column for NextAirWrestling.net, which I have done in the past. Um, but I figured because these episodes are so great, and I probably talked about a few of them. I know I probably talked about this show here on WrestleRant, surprisingly enough, right after it happened, you know, four years ago. But I figured it'd be fun to revisit them and rewatch them on the WWE Network. <clears throat> And of course, these shows have always been monumental. I did a whole article last year for Bleach Report counting down the top 10 or top 15 moments in post-WrestleMania Raw history. And it was a great list. In my opinion, I thought I put together a really, really good list and it came out really well. Um, but this, you know, this has been a tradition dating back to when Raw first started in the mid-90s. In 1993, 94, 95, these moments have been happening for years. Mankind, Mick Foley debuted the night after WrestleMania on Raw back in 1996. So it's not a new phenomenon, but I will be just breaking down the 2012, 2013, 2014, and 2015 post-WrestleMania episodes of Raw's just because they're on the network. And I'm sure there's other episodes of Raw, you know, post-WrestleMania Raw's on the network from like 2001, 2000, but... I'm not as enthralled as you guys know with the Attitude Era, so maybe down the line. But for right now, for the next week or so, just WrestleMania, you know, post-WrestleManias from 2012, 2013, 2014, and 2015. So without further ado, let's kick it off here with our opening segment. Kicking off the show, I mean, opening the show technically was John Laurinaitis backstage with the rest of the roster saying that CM Punk would defend his WWE Championship later on in the night, who was, you know, Laurinaitis at that point had just become the new general manager of Monday Night Raw after winning control of the show the night prior at WrestleMania by beating Team Teddy in that multi-man tag team match. So that was announced for the show at the at the start of the hour, at the top of the hour. But kicking off the actual show was The Rock, Miami Zone. The place came unglued, less than 24 hours removed from his shocking victory over John Cena in the main event of WrestleMania 28. So Rock comes out. We're all anticipating what he's going to say because by this point, he had done it all. Not technically done it all, but he had been back for a year. He set out. He did what he set out to do in beating John Cena at WrestleMania. So what was next for The Rock? He thanked Miami. He thanked the amazing WrestleMania crowd. He thanked everybody for making his return possible. 14 months in the making. He did it. He succeeded in what he set out to do, like I said, in beating John Cena. But now what's next for The Rock? So he goes on, you know, praising the crowd for like 10 minutes before he gets to, so what am I going to do next? And he said he, that he's never going away just because he did, you know, he, he just because he defeated John Cena doesn't mean that he's going to be going away forever. So he said, uh, you know, I'm never going away again, which gets a great pop, obviously. And I know he's not in every single episode of Raw, but, you know, he's still been a part, a huge part of the WWE family over the last, you know, four or five years since he came back to the company. But he said, oh, next, and you know, in so many words, I'm just paraphrasing here, I'll be going after the WWE Championship, which got a big reaction from the crowd, great goal for The Rock, and at that point, it kind of became evident that he was going on to win the WWE Championship at some point, we had no idea when, and that Cena would probably either win the championship and Rock would win the Rumble or whatever, it ended up being the other way around, but not that it became obvious going into WrestleMania 29, but it was a great hook for uh, the next time that Rock came back to the company. So a great promo there, a great way to kick off the show. The in-ring action of the show, in-ring action portion of the show, kicked off with a United States Championship triple threat match between the then-champion Santino, yes, Santino was the U.S. champion, against Jack Swagger and Dolph Ziggler. Pretty fun match. I don't give two shits about Santino. I don't know why he held the championship for as long as he did. He was champion for a solid four or five months back in 2012. I guess as a little reward for that great reaction he got back at the chamber that year in that World WA Championship Elimination Chamber match. 
But, but beyond that, I have no idea why he held the championship for five months. He tarnished the title, to say the least. Not that it really meant anything to begin with, but you know what I mean. Anyway. The match was fun. The crowd didn't shit all over Santino like I thought they would. They did side with Dolph Ziggler, though. A big pop for Dolph Ziggler. The same Raw where he would win the World Championship a year later. I'll talk about that in a couple days, in about a week or so. Uh, but yeah, a fun little triple threat match. It was mostly a two-on-one handicap match with Ziggler and Swagger, who were a team at that time and associated with Vicky Guerrero teaming up against Santino. In the end, Santino picked up the victory, still the U.S. champion. They attacked him afterwards before Brodus Clay came out to his aid. So Brodus Clay at this time had no stories for a solid three or four months when he debuted at the uh, at the dawn of 2012 and was featured at WrestleMania in the, in the Mama segment, whatever. And then, so he came out, he headbutted Dolph Ziggler, an amazing headbutt. Ziggler ran at him, and Ziggler sold it like a million fucking bucks. Looked great, and he bounced all over the stage. So that was a cool segment. I mean, uh, the crowd took very kindly to Brodus Clay, a lot more than I thought they would, like I said, because these crowds tend to be very, very... Uh, very, very critical, I guess, of many of the superstars on the show. So after that, we had the re-debuting Lord Tensai, formerly known as A-Train, Albert, Prince Albert, later known as just Tensai, Matt Bloom, Jason Bloom, or Jason Albert, however you want to put it. That was, you know, the many gimmicks of uh, the hip-hop hippo of uh, Matt Bloom in WWE. So he came back, and it had been rumored for a couple of weeks. I remember reading on, I think, St. Patrick's Day of that year back in 2012, that he was coming back to the company. They had a bunch of vignettes for him leading up to WrestleMania. He didn't re-debut at WrestleMania, but he did come back the next night. And, of course, he got the obligatory... A train chance or Albert chance or whatever um, kind of went away pretty quickly. The match was a glorified squash with him dominating Alex Riley. And the, I was glad the commentators made you know made mention of the fact that he was previously in WWE. They didn't mention his name, but they did say he was previously in WWE before going off to Japan to hone his skills. Blah blah blah. And um, that was it. So I thought that was a cool little squash match. I mean, the lower tensile gimmick would go nowhere. He wasn't even at Extreme Rules. And he wasn't at Over the Limit either. And he didn't really do anything of note for most of his run in WWE. And the character was a massive flop. But this was a nice little re-debut for the uh, returning Lord Tensai, a.k.a. Prince Albert. Albert, you know, A-Train, whatever. However you want to put it. Um, so after that, for the WWE Championship, like I said earlier, CM Punk defending against Mark Henry in a very fun match. It might have been just an average match any other time, but because of the post-WrestleMania crowd, and I love the match they had in England, too, two weeks later. So they had this match. Mark Henry won via countout, which I thought was great to protect Mark Henry. Protected Punk. He didn't lose. Held on to the championship, and Mark Henry picked up a dominant, clean victory via countout. Um, they had another match the following week, which Mark Henry won via disqualification, which I don't remember too much about. And the England match, like I said, was very, very fun too because of the England crowd and they loved Punk, hated Mark Henry, so it was a great dynamic. And they had a very, very fun uh, no DQ match that night two weeks later. But as for this match, like I said, very fun match for the time that it got. Um, Punk and Mark Henry were, work very well together, so I'm surprised they didn't really become a full-fledged feud. And at that time, of course, Punk was in the midst of a rivalry with uh, Chris Jericho, so they couldn't do that. But speaking of whom, afterwards, Jericho came out and berated Punk, wearing his classic Y2J clothes, just in street clothes and leather pants or something, classic heel Jericho. So he comes out and smashes a bottle over Punk's head. And of course, if you've seen this segment before or you heard Jericho's podcast or read his book or whatever, you know that the bottle of beer or wine, whiskey, whatever the hell it was, um, it broke before it connected with Punk's head, but thankfully in the one instance where WWE's camera angle got it right, you can barely notice it. Um, I mean, you can kind of tell if you slow it down a little bit, you can see the bottle break before it even connects with Punk's head, but the crowd, you know, roared, you know, regardless, they gasped, they're like, oh shit, my god, like that's, that's gross, that's disgusting, how diabolical of Chris Jericho. So it was a great spot. I mean, like I said, if you know what's going to happen, you, or you can break it down, you can slow it down, whatever, and you can see it. But a uh, great camera angle that kind of defended for, and I did not even realize that when I first saw it, you know, four years ago. So after that, we had Sheamus coming out, the new World Heavyweight Champion, obviously just getting um, rained on, just uh, an outpouring of boos, of jeers for the Celtic Warrior after, you know, coming off his controversial World Championship win against Daniel Bryan in 18 seconds at WrestleMania 28, which... I would argue turn the crowd against Sheamus for quite some time. I mean, people ask me all the time when did you know the fans start turning on John Cena or Randy Orton or Sheamus. That was the moment at WrestleMania 28, in my opinion. So he comes out, gets booed out of the building to a lot of yes chants. People just want to see Daniel Bryan. He wasn't even on the show. He came out afterwards, and he also was shown backstage in a backstage segment watching Sheamus. Um, he didn't say anything. He just kind of walked to the back with AJ, and that was it. 
So that was kind of disappointing. But Sheamus came out, got booed out of the building, like I said, but before he could even speak, out comes Alberto Del Rio. And they hated Sheamus so much, they sided with Del Rio. I'm sure they wouldn't have cared. Any other any other crowd probably would not have cared, but Del Rio officially made his return. He came out at Elimination Chamber two months earlier, but he didn't wrestle at WrestleMania. I guess he wasn't ready to return to the ring yet, or they just didn't want him in that throwaway multi-man match with Team Laurinaitis versus Team Teddy, which I get. Um, that would have been a waste of his talent, in my opinion. But anyway, so he comes out and says, I deserve a match at the World Heavyweight Championship. I'll face you on SmackDown this week, and if I can beat you, I get a future shot at the title. So that set up their feud for, like, months down the line. They had that six-month feud that went basically fucking nowhere. Um, but Sheamus laid out Del Rio with uh, the Brogue Kick, and this was also the segment where the Sea Chants made their debut. See, 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 C, you know, the Spanish version of yes, obviously, for anyone hiding underneath the rock. So, um, yeah, so that was cool. Great to see Del Rio back. After that, Kofi Kingston quickly defeating Cody Rhodes, and this was after Cody Rhodes had lost the IC Championship to Big Show at WrestleMania. So Kofi beating Cody off a distraction from Big Show at the top of the stage. Throwaway match. After that, The Miz and Zack Ryder going one-on-one for the first time ever. It was a big deal to me just because I love the chemistry that these two have together, and they always have very entertaining matches. And um, that was kind of the case here, too. People probably wouldn't have cared otherwise, but being a huge fan of both guys, I enjoyed this match for what it was. You probably won't you won't think it's special when you watch it on the network, but um, I thought it was fun. And a nice little match for The Miz. I mean, it was cool to see him win his first match in, like, fucking five months at WrestleMania and break his losing streak and win his first singles match in many months on this show as well. But it went nowhere. They should have either turned him face or put him in championship contention. He went for the U.S. title at Extreme Rules, but on the fucking pre-show against Santino. So obviously, whatever renewed push they had in mind for The Miz went nowhere coming out of WrestleMania, coming out of this win over Zack Ryder. And Zack Ryder, by the way, I was really, really hoping that it would be Ryder in, like, the returning Layla or, you know, somebody versus The Miz and uh, the Miz and Eve. Because Zack Ryder had been betrayed by Eve the night earlier at WrestleMania. And she came out, too, during the show and just basically was like, yeah, I'm the new executive assistant to John Laurinaitis, whatever. I mean, Eve was great in the heel role, but I felt like they should have done more with the Eve and Zack Ryder um, feud, that program, whatever. Because she initially turned on Ryder in February. And then they made up, like, which is very realistic because people go back to their boyfriends, girlfriends all the time despite the fact they cheated. So that's very realistic with the real world. People could say that they, that wrestling's fake, but that was 100% real. Um, that would definitely happen in real life. But anyway, so Zack Ryder, like the lovesick puppy that he was, went back to Eve. She turned on him again at WrestleMania, embarrassed him in front of the whole world. And that feud went nowhere. They never rekindled that rivalry from that point forward, which was pretty disappointing. Um, but anyway, so we get to the main event segment. John Cena throughout the night had been hyped and hyped and hyped up. How will he respond to his loss to The Rock at WrestleMania? How will he react? What is John Cena going to do? Will he turn heel? And, you know, I talked about it in my WrestleMania 28 review. I mean, anyone who knows me well, anyone who knows me well knows for a fact that I fucking love the visual of John Cena sitting on the top of that stage at Sun Life Stadium in Miami, immediately removed from his loss to The Rock at WrestleMania 28. Just sitting there with a blank expression on his face, stunned, surprised, shocked, speechless, disheartened, discouraged. You name it, that's what he was. That picture was not worth a thousand words. It was worth a million, in my opinion. Um, just a just a beautiful picture. Not of John Cena, just a beautiful picture of just agony of defeat, essentially, is what it was. And um, So coming off of that, what was next for John Cena? And they replayed the videos throughout the night of him saying that if I lose to The Rock at WrestleMania, I have no career. I'm just kidding. That's Shawn Michaels, Undertaker, WrestleMania 26. No, he said something along the lines of, you know, this is it. This is my entire career. If I can't beat The Rock, then I don't know how I will move on. Um, it will be the biggest loss of my life if I, I mean, that was when he broke up with his wife, um, legitimately in real life, but um, when they got a divorce. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, he, he said in his promos that if I lose the Rock at WrestleMania, there is no coming back from it. How will I rebound? So that's what this promo was all about. He went on for like 15 minutes talking about, you know, I've heard speculation all day of people saying that uh, John Cena might be going dark or going heel. And I can promise you that will never, ever happen. Huge boost from the crowd. So he put the, 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 the um, speculation to an end there with him turning heel, coming off his loss to the Rock. But he went on to say that I will rebuild, that blah, blah, blah. I respect The Rock despite all the trash talking over the last year. I just want to say I would just like to invite Dwayne out one more time to show uh, that I respect The Rock. And, you know, 10 seconds go by, 15 seconds go by. And may I mention, too, that at one point in the segment, there were there were very uh, there was a very loud We Want Lesnar chant 
because there had been reports all WrestleMania weekend long of Brock Lesnar re-signing with the company, and I, I really, really thought I got my hopes up for a Lesnar return to WrestleMania. Didn't happen. I'm thinking there's any night to do it. It's tonight on Raw. And um, I was figuring, like, oh, please don't be Rock. Please be Brock. And people were thinking, oh, because the crowd chanted it, because John Cena acknowledged it, that means it's not happening. I'm like, oh, fuck. So Cena in an iconic, iconic moment. I still watch this back, and I still get goosebumps four months later. One of my favorite, if not my favorite, return of all time. So Cena looks the crowd. They get a great visual, a great shot of Cena from the back, looking up at the Titan Tron. You see Cena's face in the Titan Tron. He, you know, uh, extends his hand to the crowd for a brief moment before pulling it back. Da, 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 da. I know it's an awful, you know, you know, awful uh, repetition of Brock Lesnar's theme music. I apologize, but Lesnar's music goes off. The place comes unglued. The American Airlines Center in Miami, and that's where I got that phrase. Michael Cole says it all the time. It's a very cliche phrase for the WWE commentators, the WWE announce theme. But that's where the phrase I believe not. It probably didn't even debut in that in that segment, but I remember Michael Cole saying that the American Airlines Center has come unglued. Oh my! And Brock Lesnar comes out. I mean, Jim Ross would have fucking creamed his pants if he was calling this segment, but. You got to give credit where credit is due. Michael Cole handled it pretty well, in my opinion. But Lesnar comes out. They get some shots. Some fans in the crowd just going ape shit for the Beast Incarnate. And uh, he walks out wearing an all-new T-shirt. Surrounds the ring like a shark. Circling John Cena standing there. Just pointing to the crowd. Acknowledging the holy shit chants from the audience. And uh, Lesnar enters the ring. The music goes off. He extends his hand. And uh, this is where the awful camera shot comes in. So the camera gets a shot of some fan at ringside, and they completely miss Lesnar picking up Cena for the F5. So that was fucking stupid. I mean, they got another shot of him from another angle that they showed in the replay. But the initial camera shot should have been on the ring the whole time. I don't. I mean, I love the fans and whatever, but when Lesnar is about to do something, you don't cut away to the crowd. You could do that when you know before his music hits and or when it hits and get the reaction to the fans, but. You don't do it when he's about to, F5 John Cena, so per- terrible timing there. Um, but anyway, so he picks him up for the F5, you hear John Cena start yelling, and Lesnar plants him with an F5 anyway, kicks his hat to the side for good measure, great little touch there, and then he stands over Cena saying something to the crowd or saying something to the camera, which I can never you know, make out, I wish I could. Watch. I've watched the back like a million times, I still can't see what he says. So he kicks the hat over to the side, looks in the camera, says something, goes to the top rope, does his poses, um, the landscape of the WWE has changed. The anomaly has come back to Monday Night Raw, said Michael Cole, and I still get goosebumps, and I just remember losing my fucking shit during this whole segment, and my parents were asleep, my brother was asleep, trying not to wake them up, but still screaming to a pillow, um, just screaming my fucking lungs off, trying not to wake people up, and you can imagine how hard that is. Uh, it was just amazing, just amazing, and anyone who lived through this moment, if you started watching wrestling after this moment, I would strongly recommend, if you have yet to see it, I'm sure you, I'm hope, I hope you did, um, and see this moment, watch it back on the network, on YouTube, wherever, watch it back, it's fucking amazing, like I said, one of my favorite returns of all time, to close out, one of my favorite Raws of all time, um, I don't know if it's my number one top favorite post-WrestleMania Raw ever, uh, but it's certainly up there. I mean, there's only four to choose from so far from like from 2012 onward, with the ones I'm going to review in the next couple of weeks. But it's certainly up there. Just absolutely amazing start to finish and just great fucking stuff from these guys, um, from everyone involved as part of the show. So fantastic, shocking return from Brock Lesnar to, cr- to close out the night. Some good matches between The Miz and Zack Ryder. Great WWE title match between Punk and Henry. A fun little U.S. championship match. The re-debuting Lord Tensai. The returning Alberto Del Rio. Just a lot of stuff going on. The Rock teasing. The WWE championship aspirations for you know later on in the year. So a lot of great newsworthy moments from this show. That really felt like it kicked off a new era in WWE. For a short period of time. But it still felt like this is an exciting time to be a wrestling fan. You just couldn't get enough of it. So would I, re- would I, re- would I recommend that you watch the show on the network? Absolutely, fucking lootly two thumbs up, check it out on the network. And I apologize for, you know, uh, scrambling over my words, fumbling over my words. This show is just so great. It has me just in a whirlwind. We're in WrestleMania season. I'm all excited. I'm all amped up. The always amped Graham G.S. and Matthews is here for you guys when it comes to reviewing the post-WrestleMania Raws over the next couple of weeks. So like I said, the next video, unless I change up the schedule and my next couple videos go up all at once over the course of the week, I have no idea how I'm doing this yet. You know, WrestleMania week for the channel is going to be huge. WrestleMania predictions and WrestleRant videos, hashtag AskGSM, the random video blog. 
A lot of great content going up on the next week. So if you're not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Subscribe right now. Be sure to like and comment and share this video. All support is greatly appreciated. And be sure to check me out on the socials on Twitter at Russell Rant on Facebook. Give the page an old thumbs up at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. And like I said, be sure to subscribe and check out the website at nextairwrestling.net. Just never-ending content going up every single day throughout WrestleMania week. It's going to be huge, people. Be sure to check it out. So um, anyway, I appreciate your time. Be sure to, like I said, follow me on all the socials. They're down below in the description box. And I'll check you guys later on down the road. Enjoy the rest of the road to WrestleMania, and I'll catch up with you guys a little later on. See ya.